Stocks globally lost $18 trillion in 2022 during one of the worst crashes I've experienced in the stock market. Today, I'm going to go through what I've learned from trading stock market crashes from my youth uh, into my old age. Uh, I've learned a lot. I think you can benefit uh, from mistakes I've made and corrections I've made, which have benefited me greatly, uh, including in this one. And I continue to learn, and I've learned from this one, and I will trade the next one similarly to this one, but a little bit different based on what I've learned from the current crash. So I'm gonna give you what I've learned and save you pain, hopefully. Hang on. This is not financial nor professional advice. This video is for entertainment only. Hey everyone, <clears throat> the stock market uh, came into my awareness uh, dimly <laughs> in my teenage years. Uh, around 1973, I was aware uh, that the stock market was going through a crash. Uh, the stock market was really doing bad. It, it was struggling uh, to get above a thousand, okay, which, which tells you how far the stock market has come in my lifetime. Uh, like most people, I didn't really get into stocks heavily un until I was in my 30s. Okay, or late 20s, early 30s. Uh, late 20s you start and, and 30s you start to get into it heavily. Uh, and back then, uh, it was nothing like the way it is now. That, that basically, uh, you had to uh, uh, trade with a broker. You telephoned them and then they called down to New York and everything was done by hand. Uh, people would buy seats on the New York Stock Exchange so they can do uh, in real time what you do on your computer today. Uh, so uh, comparatively, it was very backward and it was such a hassle. You, you look to see what price you got on the stock you bought the next day in the paper probably. <laughs> and so most people did mutual funds back then. It was just made more sense. Uh, mutual funds, uh, you get the price uh, when you sell, you get the price that's at the end of the day uh, of that day. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's very time delayed and, and not lending itself to day trading at all, which I do to some degree nowadays. Uh, but it, it was just a very different environment uh, and there are so much more advantages. It's, you are much more equal to the brokerages trading on the New York Stock Exchange than was the case back then. Uh, so you have a better chance, uh, you have a better shot uh, right now than you than you did then for sure. I remember the 1980s as being a good time <clears throat> for stocks, uh, both mutual funds and individual uh, stocks. I still traded, it was a hassle, but I still traded some individual stocks. And I remember it as a good time. I, I mean, you had inflation, uh, interest rates were anywhere from uh, seven to ten percent for the majority of it, and stocks did well. And the reason they did well is that Reagan, he was a big spender. Reagan and Congress, I should say, were actually big spenders. Uh, he took the, the national debt up to eight trillion, which was a massive increase, okay, and was the beginning of running up the the national debt. Uh, but it it, w it was the thing to do, uh, given the conditions. We didn't have much debt at the time, uh, so you know a total debt of eight trillion, it wasn't that bad. It didn't hurt the country, and it uh, it stimulated the economy. Uh, and it, 
uh, it helped us work out of the extreme interest rates that Volcker was uh, raised uh, the interest rates so high uh, to tamp down inflation uh, because inflation was raging pretty much. Uh, so it was it was a difficult time in some ways, but in many ways it was very good for stocks. And I don't remember uh, suffering economically during that time period whatsoever, actually. People are fond of comparing uh, the current inflationary times uh, to the 1980s. But I tell you, I don't feel like it's the same at all. And the big difference is in the national debt. Uh, Powell will never raise interest rates as high as Volcker did. The reason is he cannot do it. And the reason he cannot do it is because of the national debt. It, it was run up to eight trillion back then. Well, we're, run, we're going on $32 trillion national debt now. Can you? You put a 10% interest on, on 32 trillion, that's 3.2 trillion of interest in a year. You know, the economy cannot take that. Uh, we cannot have that big of an increase uh, on the national debt. They just uh, passed. Uh, the national f funding through Congress, and it was 1.7 trillion. Okay, <laughs> you put 10% interest on the 32 trillion, and you've more than doubled the amount of of debt that you, you're going to create, if you know what I mean. So th they cannot increase interest rates to 10%. Uh, what they can do is raise it to a certain level and then hold it there, okay? Uh, Volcker, he increased the rates a lot, uh, but he, he would decrease them at times too by a lot. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see the fluctuation in interest rates that we saw in the 1980s. I think we need to believe Powell, what he says, is that he's going to raise it to a certain level and then hold it there. Uh, their current predictions are that they're probably going to raise it to about five and one quarter percent. We'll probably get an increase. Uh, we'll probably get three increases of 0.25 or an increase of 0.5, then an increase of 0.25 and then hold it there. Anyway, they're predicting that they're going to increase it 0.75 from the current 4.5 uh, interest rate that they have. Uh, so we can look forward to having interest rates over 5% for a long time. And that steady state and gradually wearing down inflation is their plan. And I think we need to believe them on this because that's really the only thing they can do. They can't shock this. I mean, 5% on 32 trillion, that will be bad enough. Uh, and I think if they see it weakening, uh, they're still going to hold it up there until they get it down below 3%, that's for sure. And I think we need to believe them that they might not flinch until they actually do get the 2%. So these times are different. Uh, we're going to have a, a, high, a relatively high interest rate uh, for a longer period of time. My first experience of a crash in the stock market was 1987. Uh, at least the first significant crash that I thought really affected me. Uh, but I had been indoctrinated with the idea that you just you get in there and you get your stocks and you get them set up and you you just hold baby hold. <laughs> and, it, you know, when you're in your your 20s and 30s and 40s and maybe even 50s, uh, it's it's OK. It's the odds are that you're going to be able to ride it out and things are going to correct and it's going to come out fine. 
And, and certainly if you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, that's very likely to be the case. And so you're ahead just to hang on. And in my mind, looking back, it's almost a flash crash because within a year, we were up and running in full scale and back to trading and making money and, and things were fine. So my first lesson in the stock market was, hey, crashes are nothing to worry about. You just ride them out <laughs> and it's fine, okay? Uh, which led to the dot-com disaster of the early 2000s, uh, which was a disaster. But having been indoctrinated with ride it out, baby, ride it out, I, I just continued to, I, I was dollar cost averaging into it. And so I continued to, to dollar cost average even while it was crashing. Uh, and so I lost money in the, in the dot com crash, but eventually that worked out too. Because uh, I'm young and you know, it, it all comes out, out in the wash, more or less. Uh, so I hung on, but you know, I, looking back on that, I was saying to myself, you know, I could have sold, I could see it was going down, that it was going to keep going down. Why didn't I sell? And then when it started to uh, uh, go back up, it, it wasn't a divine mystery. A lot of it's based on the Fed, what the Fed's doing with the interest rates. You know, when they lower interest rates to zero, you're pretty much going to recover. <laughs> Okay, and probably it's time to go back in. And so I resolved the next time this happens, I'm not just going to sit there and take it. I'm, I'm going to get out and then I'm going to get back in, which is what I did during the next crash of 2008. So what did I learn from the 2008 crash? What I learned is when the market starts to turn down seriously like it's going to crash and going to continue crashing you get out and i got out and at that time i think my portfolio had i kept it in would have lost 50 percent instead i lost like 10 percent okay and then at a certain point, you know, the Fed uh, went uh, to very low interest rates and I got back in on that basis and I wrote it back up. I got in uh, at a cheaper price than what I sold. So I prevented the loss and then I'm going to make more money c coming back on the w way back up. And so I learned, hey, this is possible to do. I think I will keep that in my notebook of how to ride a, a crash. And that's kind of become a permanent marker in my crash textbook. Next came what I will call the happiest trading of my life. And I think for many people, it was, it was probably the happiest stock trading of their lives. And that was the, the crash of of 2020, but I have a hard time even calling it a crash. You know, the government announced that they're going to lock down the economy. You know, they're more or less telling you the market is going to crash. And then once it did crash, they announced that, hey, we're not going to let it crash. You know, we're going to restore the economy. We're going to replace the economy if we have to. And so you got the, the signal, uh, we're going to crash, we're going to lock down, we're, we're going to crash. And so the idea popped into my head. I, I, I came upon the idea of inverse funds where you make money uh, for the market going down. And I, I invested in the, uh, I think it was the S Dow, where for every dollar the uh, Dow goes down, you make $3 because it's triple leveraged. It's a triple leverage inverse fund, the SDOW, S-D-O-W. 
and I think I made like $20,000, okay, as it was going down. And it was kind of a late recognition that maybe I should do that. Uh, but I, again, I learned from that crash that, hey, you can make money on the way going down. And these inverse funds are awfully handy and you don't have the hassle of doing the individual stocks, nor I, I feel kind of guilty shorting stocks. I don't like to do it. I'm naturally a bull. Uh, so to be bearish, it's, it's easier for me to do an index uh, and probably safer for, for that matter also. So after that brief crash in 2020, and the, the Fed announces uh, no interest rates, quantitative easings, uh, they're literally going to buy assets, buy bonds uh, to support the economy. I, I don't want to say they even are supporting the economy. They are replacing the economy. And that's why my financial advisors said, buy as much stock as you possibly can. And so I did. And there was this little stock called Tesla. And, and I saw that was hot. And baby, if it was hot, I was buying it. And I think in the run up uh, after that crash, I made like $400,000 on Tesla and I had like 30 or 40 other stocks. I was trading stocks like a maniac. In total on everything, I made like $900,000. On Tesla alone, Tesla made up 400,000 of that 900,000. So, what a year, what a year, what a year. So by the time 2022 rolls around, I, I still am bullish. You know, that's, uh, that's my natural inclination. But now I got my little two bag of tricks uh, to make money on the way down. Uh, but it takes me until April of 2022 to realize, you know what, uh, this market's going down. Uh, inflation is bad and uh, the Federal Reserve is starting to get serious of, about increasing uh, the interest rates, which is going to take the market down. So I start shorting the market using SQQQ, which is a triple leveraging. Well, the QQQ is the 100 largest companies on the NASDAQ. It includes all the FANGs, the, the Facebook, um, Meta, uh, Apple, uh, Amazon, Alphabet, Netflix, uh, Google, uh, plus uh, Microsoft, uh, plus Tesla all these fangs and the hundred largest companies which are mostly technology companies on the nasdaq and it triple leverages them in an inverse way uh, for every dollar that that index goes down uh, you make three dollars okay uh, and i played this uh, off and on and i sometimes day trade sometimes week trade uh, but they were short-term trades in nature and i was forcing myself to do it and i every time it would rally it would sucker me into becoming a bull again and i would try to make money that way but all in all i i made three hundred and forty five thousand dollars in 2022 mostly on the back of SQQQ, $345,000. And that's in spite of losing a lot of money trying to go bullish uh, when it rallied. Uh, so I, I would get whipsawed. I would make massive money shorting and then I would get whipsawed. But it still ended up to the positive $345,000. And I'm very happy with that. But the question is, where do we go from here? Uh, be sure to smash that like button because it really helps uh, to support the channel. And I appreciate it so much. So what's the market been doing in 2022? 
Well, it goes up, it rallies, and then it goes further down. And then it rallies again, and then you get another lower low. And then it goes up again, and you go down again, another lower low. And now it's gone up a little bit. Is it going to go up a little bit and then uh, take an even more disastrous downturn so we get the lowest low uh, and finally get the capitulation? Uh, hey, you know, it's hanging around 3850 uh, at the time of this recording. I think the low is probably around 3200, maybe 3000, maybe worst case 2800. Uh, but I'm I'm getting reluctant to play it uh, simply because I think so many people are already shorting. Uh, I've been uh, uh, day shorting, I will call it day trading, day shorting, uh, using the inverse fund SQQQ. And uh, that's worked to an extent, but I'm not doing it big time. I, I think when Tesla has come down towards 100, it's in the 120s now, it's, but it's going down towards 100. And Apple is, is ducking down below 130 and, and might be approaching 100. When these two giants are getting that low, I think the majority of the shorting uh, has been beneficial. You've benefited probably about as much as you're going to benefit. If you're extremely lucky, you might benefit more. Uh, I, I won't take that away. Or if there's some cataclysmic event, there's always that possibility. But aside from keeping a certain amount uh, to the side in case there's a cataclysmic event, I think for me, I want to be mostly in cash and getting some interest while I'm waiting for the Fed uh, to pause. Uh, and I don't think they're going to decrease interest rates anytime soon. That is a fantasy. We are going to see uh, stable interest rates uh, for a, a couple of years, unless something cataclysmically negative happens and, and the Fed is forced uh, to lower interest rates, which in that case will be a case for buying stocks again. But I, I expect it to be a steady state, uh, like around 5%, uh, maybe five and a quarter percent, and that the Fed's gonna hold that for a while. And we'll see how the economy handles that. And I think it's gonna be a process of being mostly in cash and gradually getting back in the stocks. And so that's the way I roll. Be sure to smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't already done that, hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified, and good luck to us all. Thank you. Thank you.